This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Colin in Peterborough learning how to help our bees. And I'm Shinny Somara at the UK Synchrotron, where scientists are making cosmic dust. Bees pollinate a third of our food and 80% of flowering plants. But they're under threat from climate change, toxic pesticides, disease, and increasing habitat loss. I'm in Peterborough to learn about a simple method that could be part of the route to saving our bees. This is kind of how it looked before we intervened here. Right. Bug Life is a UK-wide organisation dedicated to the conservation of bees, pollinators and all other invertebrates. So tell me about this meadow. So this is Hollywell Ponds and this is an area that is a wildlife site, but the meadow had become very degraded and then a whole army of volunteers came out here and sowed seed on the ground. At the right time of year, it looks absolutely fantastic, it's full of flowers. And I say, now we just need to try and find some. <laughs> oh, here we go. Yeah, so there's some mallow here. And uh, ragwort's usually quite good for pollinators for doing a fit count. So what work happens in this meadow today? It's called a, a pollinator fit count. Um, and basically, it's a very easy way for anybody to get involved in monitoring the number of pollinators. So it drapes this over the area. And every time an insect visits these flowers, we record it. we could be in for quite a long way. <laughs> oh, and we have got, here we are, we've got a bug on here. Oh, yes. Carrying out some pollination, so that's an other insect. There's yeah, another there hoverfly. Are. Hoverflies here coming yep. in. There's a bee on that plant there. Because it all goes into a database by people doing it all over the country, and then they can average it out and see how our pollinators are doing. Let's find a good spot for our fit count. And again, just to remind ourselves, what's the importance of keeping our pollinator populations healthy? They're incredibly important to us. Roughly one in three of every mouthful of food we eat depends on pollination to some extent. Virtually every piece of fruit is so are tomatoes and aubergines and peppers and beans and peas. The beauty of our countryside, eight out of 10 of our wildflowers would disappear within a matter of about five years. It's estimated that pollinators are worth over 600 million pounds per annum to the UK farming economy. That does really put it into perspective, doesn't it? The service provided by pollinators is not only essential to human life, but also to the natural world. It goes all the way up that food chain of disaster, really, if we lose pollinators. Of the UK's 270 bee species, 126 are now listed as scarce with 17 at risk of extinction. Much of this due to habitat loss. What kind of degradation are we looking at in the UK over the last few decades? Since the Second World War, we have lost 97% of the wildflower-rich land in this country. Now, that's an area roughly one and a half times the size of Wales. That's a huge, huge area of pollinator food that's been lost. And the end result of it is that most of the good bits that are left are little isolated pockets, like almost pollinator zoos, and there's no way to get from one to the other for the poor pollinators. And this is why we need a solution for it, and this is kind of the ethos behind bee lines. Bee 
Lines is a nationwide initiative bringing together a myriad of conservation and volunteering groups to create an interconnected system of wildflower insect pathways across the UK. There's a lot of science behind bee lines. First of all, we map the places that are really good for pollinators on a local basis, usually on a county level. We draw imaginary lines on maps to join them up to start to put that connectivity back in there. So Central Park is actually on the Peterborough Bee Line. Last year, Bug Life worked with the Peterborough Council to plant a 200 square metre stretch of wildflowers bordering the city's flagship park. And as you can see, they have now cut it. OK. <laughs> Typical. So does cutting it down encourage it to grow back up? Yes, particularly the annuals, and quite a lot of these are annuals. So we've got things like the corn marigold, blue cornflowers. Those are all annuals. Now, poppy seed will sit in ground for about 100 years, but it's an annual, and if that ground doesn't get disturbed, they don't come up. And that's why they all came up during the First World War, because of all the trench digging and the bombs going off. Disturbed the ground, up came the poppies everywhere. <laughs> But the perennials, which there are some of in here, one of the daisy family, yeah. they will come back up whether you disturb the ground or not. Chopping stuff down does seem like it's the wrong thing to do, but meadow needs management. You know, naturally meadow would be grazed. I don't think they can really put a herd of sheep into the park. <laughs> do you keep a record as, as this gets mapped out? You're following it sort of around the country as these pockets get yes, created? Yes, basically if you do something, you can upload it onto the map. If we do something, we upload it onto the map. As soon as you've got around 10% of a bee line in place in the form of stepping stones, it will become active. And are you noticing that through the fit count data that you're receiving, these are helping to see an increase in pollinators? The most recent fit counts showed a rough doubling of bee numbers on average across the city between this year and last year. So that's a very, very positive sign. Definitely, it's, yeah, it's double. It's early days to say how much of it's down to this and how much might be down to a particularly good year climatically or a bad year climatically. But it's very, very wow. promising that things are starting to pick up. And tomorrow, we are going to be doing some planting here. So you can start to see how these bits join up together. And we'll have made another great bit of pollinator connection. I have a feeling you're about to put me to work tomorrow, Paul. That's the idea. <laughs> I'll come prepared. Where are you, Ellie's? <laughs> An important part of the Beeline initiative is to spread the message that everyone should get involved, from letting your lawns grow to garden and community wildflower spaces and even herb plants on windowsills. There is now more pollinator diversity in our urban landscape than in our rural landscape. We've gone very much monoculture out in the countryside, whereas in the urban landscape, people have at least got gardens and garden plants. So Paul has gathered together some volunteers this morning here at one of the local sports centres. So let's find out what's going on. I think one of the beeline hookups is about to happen. So it's a really important part of a big national picture that you're taking part in. And we're really hopeful that we will be able to deliver one of the first bits of completed beeline in the country through Peterborough. Right, so we want to come over and grab ourselves some cones. That's it, then fill your cone up with the seeds and go off and find yourself one of these areas and start seeding it. A gentle little sprinkle on the ground. Where are these seeds from, Paul? Well, they've come from a wildflower seed provider. It's a mixture of annuals, perennials and grasses. And um, the reason for having that kind of mixture there is because in year one, you get a lovely display from the annuals. After that, the annuals will disappear unless the ground gets disturbed and the perennials will come into play. So now you need to go and find an area uh, where these poles are that hasn't already been sown. Yeah. It's a bit thick, but... <laughs> <laughs> a bit heavy-handed. So spread them out a bit. You're going to put some more in as well, yeah? If you plant them too close together, only a few of them end up surviving, whereas if you spread them out more, you'll get more of them actually survive. While some of us are better at following instructions, enthusiasm is important too. Oh, all at once. There's more. You can spread them out down here, look. Very enthusiastic spreading of seeds there. Paul, what's the advantage of getting community volunteers and citizen scientists involved? It's about local ownership. They're going to respect this space more and they're going to understand why it's happened far more than if we just come in and plant meadows everywhere. Really 
quite fascinated what's been happening and yeah. how they're doing it and what they're doing it for. So have now you... I can see why they've not cut the lawn. <laughs> I was about to ask you, have you put anything on your window box or on your balcony or in your garden differently? To I, help I, have, I have a beautiful lavender bush um, that was in plant pots that wasn't really doing very much. So I actually planted it in the garden and it's absolutely flourished beautifully. But also I've not cut the grass as much. And it's lovely to sort of like have the wildlife coming in the garden. Paul, why is this work necessary? Creating bee lines, putting that connectivity back there is absolutely essential for certainly the continuation of the kind of lifestyle that people are used to. It would be a very dull and boring world if we were to lose our pollinators. You'd go back to just having things like conifers and ferns, like it was in prehistoric days before all this wonderful abundance of florid beauty was created. And in many ways, the bee lines are like the motorways for pollinators. And of course, after motorways, you still need the bee roads and the sea roads, which is why even if you're not on a bee line, you can still do and should do something to make a difference for pollinators. But if you're on a bee line, you should do everything you can to try and make sure that that stepping stone is in place, that that line starts to function, that our pollinators can move around the country and continue to provide all that lovely food that we enjoy. OK, everybody, it's now time to go stamping. So you can get all that aggression out by going and stamping on the ground and just pushing your seeds into the ground. Just a little thing can make a huge difference. And if we all make that little step, you would make one huge big step for nature. Sort out the bugs and the other things will sort themselves out. on our YouTube channel. Search for Razor Science Show and it will take you straight there. Remember to subscribe and hit the bell button for notifications. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you. All around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN, see the difference. Your world changed today. What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice.
Hello, I'm Stephen Cole at CGTN's European headquarters in London. My international guests help me help you set your agenda. A well-looked-after body will make the brain happy. That is the evidence. We want to share the benefits of China development. This story is far from finished. Join me on the agenda at these times every week. For science, behind the scenes insights, groundbreaking research, and even some fun, check out our Razor podcast. Search Razor Sounds on all major streaming platforms. And remember to subscribe so you don't miss out on any episodes. Astronomers now believe that every star in the galaxy has at least one planet and that as many as one-fifth of those are Earth-like and able to harbor life. But so far we've only detected these so-called exoplanets indirectly by seeing how they dim the light from their stars as they pass in front of them. In the next decade, astronomers hope to build a space telescope able to image an Earth-like planet orbiting another star and determine whether it might be able to harbor life. Professor Jeremy Kasdin of Princeton University and the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory are working on technology that will enable us to do that. The problem is that light from stars is 10 billion times brighter than any planet orbiting them. So, in order to see exoplanets, we need to dim the light from that star. What's needed is a star shade that can be placed between the space telescope and the star. The star shade will be about the size of half a football field and will have to fly 50,000 kilometers away from the telescope. But a design like this doesn't work very well because the light waves diffract around the screen like water bending around a rock, destroying any chance of seeing planets. One solution was first suggested by Lyman Spitzer, the father of space telescopes. He suggested that if we soften the edges of the star screen, we can control the diffraction, letting us see planets. This is known as the flower petal star shade. If the edges of these petals are made exactly right, diffraction of the star's light can be controlled to create a shadow in which we can see the planets. This is not science fiction. The first half-scale sunshade has already been made at Northrop Grumman in California, and its petals unfilled exactly as they should. Just outside Oxford is an extraordinary machine, the United Kingdom's synchrotron. Inside this massive building, electrons are accelerated to near the speed of light, creating a type of giant microscope which allows scientists to examine matter in minute detail, revealing the atomic structure of the world around us. The first solid matter known to have ever been formed was cosmic dust. Our entire solar system is made from it, but only limited amounts of it make it back here to Earth, which makes it really difficult to study. But here in the synchrotron, researchers are trying to do just that, recreating cosmic dust to ask some big old questions about the origin of life. Personally, I, I want to know where we came from. Meet senior beamline scientist Stephen Thompson. He's using the synchrotron to study the behavior of space dust. Dust is the very original material. It's the first thing that forms. It's the first thing that formed in the history of the universe. It's the first thing that forms around a star now. It's the stuff for which everything is made, including us. And we want to understand how that behaves, how it evolves, how it got from almost soot-like materials around a star to the complex, fascinating world we see around us. Around 1% of the mass of the interstellar medium within our galaxy is made up of cosmic dust. Billions and billions of tons of the stuff. While we know its chemical composition, we have very little available on Earth to study. So Stephen replicates it in his lab. Salts is magnesium chloride, this is sodium silicate, and one here is and iron sulfate, and I mix them together in a process known as sol gel, so sort of gelatinous solid, which is our starting point 
for making our dust. And how do you know what that chemical composition is? Uh, that's been put together very carefully by astronomers who've made lots of observations of stars and analysis of things like meteorites and recovered materials. The composition of space dust is known to be a predominantly amorphous magnesium and iron silicate, something that can be replicated in the lab and experimented on. I mix the chloride with the sulphate first. And when we mix them together, we get this green gelatinous material. It's a mixture of water and the gel. What we would normally do then is we'd let, either let that settle or we put it into a centrifuge. We separate the water from the gel material. We would then take the gel and we'd stick it in a microwave, an ordinary domestic microwave. That is going to completely change the way I see the microwave in my kitchen. I mean, you're actually making something that is only in outer space. We're making a model of it. It's not the actual same thing. It obviously, there's not a microwave in space. This we would cook for about 10 minutes, and this is actually a massive improvement. Previously, we used to use this, which is a vacuum furnace. It dries the gel under vacuum. If you want to make a lot of it, it will take you a very long time. Whereas in the microwave, we can do a whole batch of different compositions in just a few minutes or over the course of one day, very quickly. And that's a big step forward. This is our final product we've just cooked. Oh, wow. Incredible. And just in 10 minutes. Just in 10 minutes. And there are billions upon billions and billions of tons of this floating around in space. Incredible. When it was first switched on, the diamond light source synchrotron became the brightest source of light in our solar system. 10 billion times brighter than the sun. The machine accelerates electrons to near light speed. This is amazing. Look at the scale of this. So Isabel, what part of the facility is this bit? This is the experimental hall and this is the storage ring. Uh, the storage ring is one of the three particle accelerators that we use to generate very brilliant beams of light. So underneath our feet right now are electrons moving around. That's right. In a vacuum pipe with um, magnets around the vacuum pipe. And actually, where I'm standing here is where the electrons are, are traveling, that, that yellow line that you see. And at various points, you'll see a little kind of red circle on the line. And that is actually at the point at which the electrons are generating that light. What's known as a bunch, which contains billions of electrons, is generated in the electron gun and then directed into the linear accelerator. A small booster ring energizes the electrons before they're injected into the main storage ring. The storage ring consists of 50 straight sections angled together with powerful magnets. When the path of the electron beam is bent by the magnets, energy is lost in the form of light. The beams of light coming off are very carefully channeled down what we call here beam lines. These lorry-like containers, most of it are yellow because they are x-rays. The white part is actually the control cabin where the scientists would be sat doing their measurements. So the section that you see in front of you all the way here is repeated 24 times in that tunnel, that half a kilometre tunnel that we stood upon earlier. So this is underneath the concrete slabs? This is actually what is beneath the concrete slabs, that's right. There are 32 beam lines that branch off from the synchrotron ring. The beam line that Stephen uses is the only long-duration synchrotron facility in the world, allowing him to work using longer timeframes. One of the experiments we did was to see how it reacts with humidity because there's a lot of water vapour in certain areas of space. And so what we did, we put it, designed a special chamber here, which is a humidity chamber, it's got a controlled humidity, and we put our dust here inside and we exposed it for about a year to see how that affected the properties of the dust, the structure of it, how it evolved. And so is that what you're trying to determine then by all these experiments and all of this amazing machinery? We want to know it, everything around you had to come from somewhere. We want to know where that is. The dust in space is transformed by heat, gases or pressure into planets and other objects to form solar systems. 
Stephen hopes to gain insights into this process by applying similar forces to the cosmic dust he has created over a long period of time and analyzing how its composition changes. And that's where he needs the power of the synchrotron. If you heat something, you know it changes its properties. Sometimes it changes its structure. If you heat water from ice, it goes from a solid to a liquid. Same with all materials. If you heat them or do other things to them, their internal structure reorganises and changes. And that's what we can measure with the synchrotron. How does the interaction of light meeting this space dust to give us those answers you're looking for? The light we use are X-rays, but much, much more powerful. So powerful you couldn't put a human in them. The X-rays go into the material and they bounce off the atoms inside and then scatter. And if you took a picture of that scattering, you would see a pattern. And if you analyse that pattern, you can work out the structure, how the atoms orientate themselves relative to each other. The dust in its interstellar form has a disordered structure captured here in the X-ray pattern as rings with less definition. After the application of heat, gases or pressure, the atomic arrangement transforms into a crystalline structure, which has a well-ordered internal structure, which corresponds to well-defined rings in the X-ray pattern. So is the key essential part of this facility to see the structures? The structure is the key to everything. All the advances in modern technology, all the advances in pharmaceuticals, understanding how the structure behaves, the advances in batteries, life sciences, all down to structure. We really live in a materials age where structure, understanding structure is the key thing. In this beamline, a number of other projects are underway, from studying how super alloys change under extreme heat in airplane turbines, to samples of cannonballs from the Tudor shipwreck, the Mary Rose. It's such a vast space here. How significant is the scale? The size is fundamental because the larger the ring that produces the light, the brighter the light is. And, and the more powerful, the faster we can make measurements, the greater the detail with which we can reveal the structure of matter. So it might be a biologist who wants to understand the way in which the molecules of life in your body work. It could be someone who wants to develop new metals for a jet engine, all of which fundamentally requires to look at where the individual atoms are. There's so much going on here from massive components being moved to things being fitted and fixed and recalibrated and even though what they're working with is on a tiny scale what they're achieving is actually massive the diamond light source synchrotron is a triumph of the huge and the very small one of only 60 such facilities in the world, it allows scientists from a range of disciplines to find answers to practical applications and to ask the really big questions, like, where do we come from? So from dust you can make in a microwave, you can ask such fundamental questions using this machinery. It's amazing. You've got something, as you say, you made in a microwave, a machine as big as diamond to see something as small as an atom to tell you something about materials that form around stars that are billions and billions of miles away. It's amazing. Would we drive the full rays flat out? We would not make it to the end. So it means we have to save some energy while we are racing. So if we can bring the energy from the battery more efficiently to the road, we can drive longer on the straight, we have to lift later, and hence we are quicker. Will any of that technology that's being developed filter down to an average car? Obviously we're not taking the electric machine from our Formula E car and put it one-to-one -one into the production car. But we are developing technologies and these technologies can also be used in production cars. And that is true for the hardware, that is true for parts of the software. The high voltage technology that was first part of the LMP1 hybrid car, that was like 800 volt technology, is now something that is part of the Taycan. That is an example that is easy to show, easy to understand. 